Hey guys, it's Dr. May. How are you? Um, well, I'm excited to present to you today um, a presentation that I did at a local library a few months ago, um, and I call it Time is on Your Side, kind of like the song. And um, it was a lot of fun to research, and I learned a lot doing it, and I hope you'll learn a lot um, having me present it to you. It gives us like a special kind of insight into ourselves and our relationship to time. So I hope you enjoy this one. Um, here we go. All right, so time is on your side and almost, yeah, there we go. So um, then I'll add after that, how to skillfully relate to your past, present, and future, okay? So um, here we go. All right, so uh, this is a really cheesy, but during our time together, <laughs> we're gonna discuss um, different ways of measuring time throughout history based on our cultural needs, okay? So we're gonna get a little history lesson first. Then we're gonna talk about what they call time orientation. So it's kind of like our different ways of relating to the past, present, and future, okay? And then finally, because I like to end on a skillful note, we're gonna talk about some tips that create healthier ways for us to relate to time, okay? So here we go. All right, so what is time? If we're gonna talk about it, we might as well <laughs> uh, define it, right? Uh, we all kind of know what it is, but let's get an actual definition here. Okay, so time, is the ongoing and continuous sequence of events from past to present to future, right? And it's a measurable period, right? So it implies some kind of measurement, okay? During which an action, process, or condition exists or continues, okay? And there's different ways to measure it, which we're gonna talk about. And it implies change and movement. And that's one of the hard parts about time because we struggle with change, right? And the passage of time naturally implies some change, all right? So here's the thing. One of the main concepts I talk about is time keeps passing. No, no matter what we do, we can't stop it, right? But we decide how we measure it, divide it, and use it based on our needs and our circumstances, right? And we might have a natural way to do this in a certain kind of a way, but if it's not working for us really well, we could actually change that a little bit, okay? And shift the way we relate to time in those types of ways. Okay, so one of the things that they do is they divide things in a rough kind of a way into what they call event time and clock time, okay? So event time is when um, events kind of begin and end based on just like a natural flow of things, okay? So let's say I invite all you YouTube peeps, right? All my YouTube friends to my house for a big barbecue, okay? So we get together, we're hanging out, and then at a certain point in the afternoon, we start talking, we realize, hey, we're getting a little hungry, you know, Let, let's fire up the grill, let's start to get some uh, dinner going. So by mutual consensus, we're starting to decide when it's going to be time to eat. So then we sit down, we eat, we have the burgers and the hot dogs and chicken or whatever we have, right? We hang out, we're talking, we're eating. And then when we feel like we're about done, we wrap it up and maybe we, you know, do something else, we hang out, we play a game or something like that, okay? So it's not very structured. But based on our social interactions, we kind of mutually figure out when things are going to begin and end. So it's kind of flexible, right? Clock time's a lot more exact. So if um, you go to school, let's say, and each period of class starts and ends at an exact time, right? Or your workday might start and end at a specific time. Or TV shows might start and end at a specific time, right? So that's clock time. There's like an actual schedule, and it's much more exact, okay? So it's, it really is a kind of a spectrum between both, and we have kind of relationships to both types of time, but some of us kind of gravitate towards one or another, okay? And over historical periods, things have changed too. Like in the long, long past, things were much more event time, and then getting more toward the current time right now, things have evolved much more closer to clock time. But even within cultures, it could change. Even within people, this could, this could vary, okay? All right. So here we go again, let's take a trip through time, okay? So we're gonna take a little trip through history here to understand this better. And I want this to kind of shake up your ideas about what time's all about, all right? So let's go way, way, way back. All right, hunter-gatherer societies, right? The most primitive societies that were around for human beings. So they were kind of just trying to survive. They're in a very rough environment, you know, the predators, animals around, maybe other tribes, Food might have been scarce, you know, so they're just trying to get by day to day. So they pretty much had to live in the present because you never know if there's going to be a tomorrow, right? Your, your life was at risk, physical risk all the time, okay? So they were very present oriented, okay? 
eventually, you know, people started planting crops and became an agrarian society, right? So that means that they're farmers. So then they had to expand their view of time, right? So now we're thinking about the future. What, I have to think about when I'm planting the crops, how do I tend to the crops, when am I harvesting the crops? If there's animals involved, I got to think about their cycles of, you know, when they're born, when they migrate, and we might have to follow the animals if we're a little more nomadic, okay? So there's a larger view about cycles in time, okay? Um, I might even rely on lunar cycles or sun cycles or seasonal cycles, okay? So it's a little bit more future coming in. Okay, so ancient Egypt, um, they were somewhere, they said, between event time and clock time, right? So things were getting a little bit more precise. So let's say we're at that scene there and we're in the marketplace, right? So I may not have a watch to tell me I'm coming at nine and I'm leaving at five. Maybe, you know, when I feel like it, I'm going to come there and I'm going to start selling my stuff, okay? Like sometime in the morning. And then sometime in the afternoon when it feels right, I'm going to wrap it up. But there's some kind of a schedule going on. There's also some views of the future because, you know, there's um, people getting married, there's people having children, there's people having certain kinds of rituals, right? So there's a sense of the future with a little bit more structure than before. Okay, Middle Ages. All right, so now they actually have clocks. Clocks have been developed, okay? But the clocks are usually on clock towers and they're in public places like the town square. So if you want to know what time it was, you had to go to the town square and look at the clock tower to see what time it was. But also every town decided on their own what time it was going to be, right? So it wouldn't be consistent from town to town. It was approximate, but we all just decided independently, you know what, right now I think it's about 10 o'clock and that's good enough, <laughs> okay? Um, so not as precise and coordinated as now. They also had these big, like, church kind of bells or town bells, right? And they would ring at significant portions of the day. So there was some sense of dividing up the day based on significant events, such as the beginning or the end of the workday, or for monks, because it was very religiously oriented, especially in Europe, you know, what time of the day would there be prayer times? There were certain times of the day where the bells would ring and the monks would pray, right? So we have a little more division here and some access to clocks and, you know, more clock time. Okay, and early ways of measuring time, right, were not as precise as the clocks we have now with the quartz and measurements and all that kind of stuff. Um, so they were approximate and they were based on the natural flow of certain things, such as the movement of the sun or in the hourglass that, you know, the passage of the sand through that little opening or clepsydra has to do with water flowing through. Incense had to do with how fast the incense burned. Candle clocks had to do with how fast the candles burned and oil lamp clocks had to do with how fast the oil burned, right? So there was approximate measurements based on how these things naturally flowed, okay? But then we had to have a need to make things a little more exact, right? So with the development of the railroads in the 1800s, in the US they said, you know, wait a minute, we can't have every town just creating their own time. How are we supposed to figure out the train schedules, right? How do I know when to pick up the train? Is it the time from my town or your town? So they decided, okay, well, let's make it a little more standard. So in the US, they said, we're gonna have four time zones in the continental US, and that will help us with the railroads. And then a little bit after that in Europe, they came up with what they call Greenwich Mean Time, and that helped coordinate some of the time schedules in Europe, all right? So we have a little more standardization and accuracy now. All right, and then, um, clocks weren't just something you had to go to the public square to see, right? It was something that became accessible to people, right? So it became like a little easier to get a clock in your home and a pocket watch and a watch. And now it gives me the power to set my own schedule, to follow time in my way and to figure out my day based on the time I could see on my, my watch or my own personal timekeeping device. So this was kind of a good reflection at the time of Western individualism, right? Because I have my own individual timepiece that's for me. Okay, and then the Industrial Revolution came, and here time equals money. So before, when people were doing stuff in industry, money was about how many products you made, right? So if I'm a shoemaker and I made a dozen shoes, I could sell each of those shoes and make a certain amount of money for each of those shoes. And it didn't matter how long it took for me to make them necessarily, 
the profit I got was based on the product, okay? But in the Industrial Revolution, when factories came, people sold their time for money. So if I worked an eight hour day, or maybe even like a 16 hour day, whatever was going on back then, I would get paid by the hour, right? And it didn't matter exactly how much I produced, the money I earned was based on the time that I sold to, to that company, okay? So this is a newer concept that time equals money. And it also increased the sense of clock time, right? Because you're getting paid by the hour and future orientation, right? So I know if I work this amount for this amount of time, it could earn me this amount of money, right? So it got me thinking more along those lines. Okay, another thing that changed our perspective about time is that with new health innovations, people are living way longer than they used to live, right? So if this was like 100 years ago, I'd be starting to wrap things up pretty soon. <laughs> I'd say, you know what? I'm a certain age and I, I could die at any time because uh, I'm kind of getting old. But now, you know, people are living like in their 80s to their 90s. So you have a much longer view of your own life and what you could expect for yourself and what you could accomplish, right? There's some kind of a commercial out there and they go, I got a long life ahead, big plans, <laughs> right? And it's an older woman who's saying that. And we are able to look ahead in that way. And it shifts the way we deal with time, knowing that there's possibly more of it for ourselves, right? Okay, don't you love this picture? <laughs> I can't even believe I found this picture online. But so around the 50s and 60s, um, but it became a little more popular in the 60s. So the Eastern mindfulness and meditation um, philosophies and religions and so forth were introduced in the West, right? So now, instead of just running on clock time and this future orientation of time equals money and all that business, people started to realize, hey, it's pretty good to be in the present moment sometimes, right? I could kind of just meditate and be in the now and explore that whole thing. And so that shifted the way we start to think about time in the West, because now we have this concept um, from the East that we're, you know, kind of integrating into our life, okay? Okay, another thing that's happening too is that, you know, we have a very overscheduled culture. You know, the clock time has gone kind of overboard, right? We're expected to do more and more with our time. You know, we have innovations to make things go faster, but then we're expected to do more and more and more. And sometimes the pace of it can be really overwhelming and the amount that we have to pack into our day gets really overwhelming. So this adds to our stress level. And so the way, you know, the time speeds by and the way we have to manage it is becoming a source of, you know, stress for a lot of us, okay? All right, so that was my trip through history. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about what they call time orientation, all right? So this is about our relationship with time and how we deal with the past, present, and future. So I'm gonna talk about what the research has found uh, are different time orientations, and then you can start to reflect and think about like, how do I relate to each one myself? Which ones apply to me the most, okay? All right, so let's start with the past and we'll move through the future. So past positive orientation. So on the one hand, it's kind of like that sentimental picture that's there, almost like a Norman Rockwell type picture where you could look at your past and have some pleasant memories that you reflect on. You have a positive attitude toward your past. Maybe you have memories of the kind of people that influenced you or the things you've done, maybe good memories of school or vacations or friendships and things like that. And drawing upon that helps you feel good now. However, you don't have to have a good past or a positive, like a you know, pleasant past to have a po past positive orientation, okay? Even if you had a lot of problems in your past, you could still develop a past positive orientation if you're able to draw lessons from them and say, you know, even though such and such was a big struggle for me, I needed that to happen because I, I, I learned lessons I would never have learned otherwise. It really shaped me into being who I am today. And so that's part of the past positive orientation too. So it's reshaping the story of the narrative you have about the past in order to like, you know, gain something positive from it. So there's even like the sense of gratitude, like I'm glad I went through this tough time because it made me who I am and it taught me something, right? And having this past positive orientation in that kind of a way could actually lead to more resilience and optimism about the future. Because So if, even if I'm going through something hard now, if in the future I could look back at it and draw a lesson, that's gonna to lead to resilience, right? So that means bouncing back from stress. So seeing the good things about the difficult times is part of resilience. 
Okay, so past negative orientation. All right, this might sound a little bit more familiar to some of us, okay? So if you had problems in your past, okay, and they're really bothering you now, that's probably more of a past negative orientation. So if you find yourself blaming your current unhappiness on things that have happened to you, so let's say you were mistreated by your parents, you were bullied in school, you lived in a poor neighborhood, um, you know, you had a lot of health problems, whatever it was, and you say, because I went through that, it's really screwed me up now. You know, I wouldn't be having the problems I have and the unhappiness I have now if that didn't happen. And because that happened, I'm really screwed up, okay? And you might ruminate about this, you might feel yourself to be a victim of your past, you might resent a lot of people in your past that you feel had a very negative impact on you. And so this orientation creates a lot more suffering now, okay? And you know, it, we go through this sometimes, but if you're dominated by this past negative orientation, this could be having a big impact on you. So just, just have an awareness of that, okay? Without judging it, just notice it. Okay, so now we're moving into the present. There's a few different present orientations. One is present hedonistic, right? So hedonist is for someone who's pleasure seeking, okay? And so this could have some pros and cons. So on the one hand, it can really help you to enjoy the now, right? So if you're those kids in that picture, you know, skipping through the meadow and playing with bubbles, and you're really in the moment enjoying it, that's present hedonistic. Or if you're getting a massage and you're really digging it and it feels great, present hedonistic. Or if you're like that older couple and maybe they're having a beautiful day at the beach or a really nice vacation and they're, they're, the pleasure of the now is really enhancing them, that's great, right? That's something we could all learn how to do a little bit better sometimes because we get to be a little negative sometimes, right? Um, however, this could backfire if it becomes like you're so indulgent in certain pleasures that it becomes like an addiction, right? So if I'm like the Will Farrell picture on the upper right, and I just want to party and get smashed and, you know, take risks and, you know, sleep with somebody that I just met or, you know, drive my car real fast and just live it up in the present. That could kind of get me in trouble sometimes, right? Because if I'm not thinking ahead, I can make maybe some impulsive decisions, right? Or if I'm so fixed on getting this high right now, but I forget how, what's going to do for me later, that could get me in trouble, okay? So we just have to be careful that that dark side of the present hedonism, all right? Next, um, present fatalistic. So basically, if you're in really difficult situation right now, so let's look at some of these examples here. Let's say I live in a really poor crime-ridden neighborhood or I'm unemployed and I'm really struggling to find a job. Maybe I've been unemployed for a while. Or maybe I'm a kid in school and I have a learning disability and no matter what I do, I, I, can't, I just can't get it. I, I, I don't do well in school. Or um, let's say I'm locked up. Let's say I'm hospitalized or I'm in jail and it, it seems like no matter what I do, I can't get out. So this is like a sense of like, my circumstances are really bad right now and my efforts aren't really changing them. I've tried things and no matter what I do, I, I can't get out of this. I can't break this cycle of poverty. I can't get smarter and, and succeed in school. No matter what my efforts do, they just fail. And so because you feel like a lot of these circumstances are out of your control, you feel kind of like a hopelessness, a helplessness, you know, or maybe like kind of cynical or bitter about life. And so, you know, this could be um, something that's really painful to go through. Um, and the quote I put in, which really kind of captures it, is nothing I do will matter for my future. So what's the point in trying? Whatever will be, will be, right? So you almost feel like giving up, like your efforts won't even matter. All right, and sometimes when we're depressed, we get this way too, but sometimes it's very based on our circumstances, okay? All right, so this is the holistic present, okay? So it's kind of a little more related to those hippies we saw in that other picture. So um, if you're practicing mindfulness or meditation or things like yoga or, you know, like, you know, qigong and things like that, and you're in the moment doing these practices, that's kind of like the holistic present, right? So you're being in the present with this moment to moment awareness, you're observing yourself, you're noticing your sensations, you're noticing what's around you. And um, sometimes you're, it almost feels timeless, right? When you're kind of really into that mindfulness, you're kind of almost beyond time, you know, just kind of like 
being in the moment with whatever you're doing. And um, that this orientation, again, is very associated with things like mindfulness, and it could actually be very healthy. Okay, so now we're finally getting to the future. So pros about a future orientation, right? So if you're able to think about what's gonna come next, it can help you make a good decision for now, right? So when people say to you, you gotta think about the consequences, right? Where they're trying to induce in you, like have a future orientation. Don't just do something impulsive right now, right? Think about what's gonna happen later, okay? So it's about planning ahead. It's about focusing on your goals and how are my choices now and it helped me with these goals in the future, right? And sometimes it's like sacrificing in the now in order to gain something later, right? So if I was still a student, um, and let's say my goal is to get into a good college and get a good job. So in order to achieve that goal, keeping that future in mind, I might choose to give up some fun playing video games right now in order to study for my test. Or, you know, maybe I'll make sure I'm engaging in some positive activities in school some clubs and stuff like that, instead of just FaceTiming my friends. Because I, I'm thinking like, this is gonna be good for my future. This is gonna help me, right? So it helps us make better decisions about the now when we think about the later. Okay, so some negatives about a future orientation, because we could, we could make anything negative, right? We're so good at it. Um, so sometimes, you know, we set up very rigid expectations about how our future is supposed to be. And then if it doesn't turn out that way, we get really upset and disappointed. Ever see American Idol? Right. And some contestants come on and they say, I don't know if, if I don't win this contest, if I don't become the next American Idol, like, I don't know what I'm going to do. Like, I, I put all my eggs in one basket. This is this is the thing that I want. And if it doesn't happen, I'm going to freak out. Right? <laughs> or sometimes in a more general sense, let's say um, if I don't have a, a career and a family and kids by 30, I, I think my life is going to be over. I, I don't know how that's supposed to be right? We're very rigid about it sometimes. So we have to be more flexible about what could happen, right? So, but if we're too rigid, this could go wrong. Um, another thing is um, all you anxiety people out there, right? The what ifs, okay? A lot of worries about our future and the uncertainty about the future. Well, what if this happens? What if that happens? What if it doesn't work out, right? And we kind of ruminate about all these what ifs and we worry about the future, okay? Too much instead of just letting it unfold. Sometimes we have a very hopeless view about the future, maybe because we've suffered a lot so far and we feel like it's just gonna be bad. I, I can't imagine it being any better than it is right now. Or I see what's coming, like it's not gonna improve. Some people in my hospital worry about discharge in the future because they say, well, so what's gonna happen to me? I'm just gonna be in a residence? I, I may not have a job? Like, am I just gonna be a patient my whole life? That it's hard to see beyond your imagined negative view of the future and give yourself other possibilities. Um, another thing that could be a, a drawback of a future orientation is that you could be so busy making choices that are good for your future that you don't leave any time for enjoying the now, right? Like if I was that girl and all I did was work, 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 work because it would be good for my future, maybe I'm missing out a little bit, right? So I have to carve out some time for, for me and for my enjoyment too. Right? So it's like a lack of balance. Okay, and then the transcendental future. All right, so there's pros and cons to this. So basically transcendental future means the future beyond my lifetime, my physical lifetime. So it could mean in an earthly sense, like generations that are beyond me, whether in my family or just in general. You, know, you hear about the seventh generation, like Native Americans talk about, you know, we want to make decisions that are good for seven generations into the future, right? So let's say, I'll try to make decisions that are good for the environment because I want the environment to be in good shape for seven generations into the future, right? So I'm not going to pollute the oceans. I'm not going to create more carbon gas because I want the earth to be in good shape for them, right? So that's like a transcendental future orientation. And it could help me make good decisions now because I'm thinking that far ahead. Other times in a more um, spiritual sense, it might be like, well, I'm going to make good decisions in my lifetime because I know it'll increase my chances of getting to heaven later or having an afterlife that's more pleasant and satisfactory to me, okay? So I'm gonna follow these guidelines that I've learned through my religion or through other spiritual ideas and live my life that way now because that'll help me out in the afterlife, okay? And you know, it could actually help us cope with the present thinking that these things can happen in a positive way if I deal with difficult circumstances in a better way now. 
Okay, but there's also cons to this too. So they talk about some people, let's say, I'm just giving an example, like in the Middle East, and they're very radicalized Muslims, not the typical Muslims. I mean, I know a lot of Muslim people that are very nice people, but people who, you know, don't see much, don't really care very much about the earthly life. And they have very extreme ideas about what they need to do to get themselves and their family into paradise with Allah, right? And they feel like, well, it's totally worth it to be a suicide bomber and blow myself up and because in these cert certain circumstances, because it'll guarantee paradise for myself and my family. So they're so focused on this transcendental future that they'll do something that's really destructive now. It could even be related to some of the school shooters that have been around where, you know, I'm being bullied right now. I'm ostracized. I'm an outcast. I have nothing to live for right now. So I might as well create this fame for myself by shooting up the school and then killing myself in the end. And that's the only way it's going to go. And then I'll live for the future after this life because there's nothing for me right now. All right. So this one gets a little bit scary sometimes. Okay. All right. So based on all these things, so what time perspective do you think is best or time perspectives? Oh, so think about it for a minute. Okay. So actually, the research has been done, you know, and what they found is that all the ones highlighted in yellow are the healthiest ones to have. So basically, the past negative and present fatalistic aren't really good for much of anything. Um, they, they really don't have any positive impacts on us. But if the past positive is relatively high, is high, present hedonistic is moderately high, the future is moderately high, that's really good. They also um, have a little less research on the transcendental future and holistic present, but they generally feel like those are positive time orientations too, if they're used the right way. Okay, but we'll do an example now. Okay, so I think we've all been down this road before, right? The choice between unhealthy and healthy foods. And so we make decisions now based on our time perspective in a lot of sense, if you think about it, right? So let's say I have a past positive time perspective. The decision I make might be based on experiences I've had in the past eating those different foods. Like maybe, oh man, I remember those times me and my friends had a great time eating burgers and pizza and stuff like that. Oh, I think I'm going to choose that now, right? Or maybe I have a past negative orientation. Like, oh yeah, you know what? The last time I had a burger, my stomach ache was so bad. I was up all night with a horrible stomach ache. I think I'm going to choose the broccoli. Okay. Um, if you're in the present hedonistic, you might be like, oh, I'm just eating the most tasty thing ever because I just really want to enjoy it. Right. Present fatalistic might be like, no matter what I do, it doesn't matter anyway. So flip a coin. I'll just pick whatever. Who cares? Eh, might just have the French fries. Holistic present might be like, whatever I'm eating, I'm just going to eat it mindfully and just really enjoy it. <laughs> right. Okay. So future orientation might be like, well, I'm going to eat the broccoli now because I know it's going to make me healthy in the future and it's going to keep my cholesterol down. So I'm just going to choose the vegetables. Okay. Transcendental future might be like, well, you know, it's much more environmentally sustainable to pick um, the vegetables and the fruits than it is to eat, to have meat products, which produces a lot of methane gas. So I think it'll be better for future generations if I eat the vegetables. <laughs> okay. So, you know, see how it influences our decisions and why we make decisions based on our time perspective. Okay. Um, all right. So some other time issues. All right. So this can, didn't quite fit into the other categories, but kind of worth mentioning anyway. Okay. So one big thing that comes up is we're unhappy with the pace of things, right? So sometimes we get very frustrated with how slow things are going and we wanted to hurry it up, hurry it up, right? Whether it has to do with this line is going way too slow. I wish you would hurry it up and the people would go faster in the grocery store so I can get to the front of the line. Or it could be like, I hear from some guys in my hospital, when am I gonna get my privileges? Oh, it's taking so long. I wanna just get out of here. I just wanna get more privileges. I wanna move on with my life. This is going way too slow for me, All right? Other times we, we feel like things are going too fast. And if you think about it, with time comes change and the change gets scary. And the more time that passes, the more change that happens. So we wanna slow down time in order to reduce the changes that are happening so we can catch up with it. So it doesn't feel like the change is so fast and overwhelming, right? Um, on some level, it might be like, oh my God, my kid's growing up so fast. I just want them to stay little. I wish time would slow down. Or it could be like, oh my God, my mom's dying and the, the time just keeps, seems to go so fast and it, it, the faster it goes, the quicker she's gonna die. And I wish it would just slow down so I'd have more time. 
Um, but it could be other things too. All right, so the pace issue does come up. Okay, um, other times um, it's a problem when we don't spend time based on our goals, values, and priorities, right? Sometimes we get so hooked into certain habits of the way we spend our time that we lose track of the fact that we're not spending it the, the way we really want to, okay? So sometimes we waste time. You know, how much time have you spent scrolling through your feed on Facebook or, you know, looking on social media or, you know, doing things online that just wasted time? Watching TV, Netflix binging, just, just to pass the time, but it's not really, the, the way you really want to spend your time. Like that takes some actual self-reflection, self right? Um, procrastination, another big issue, right? Putting things off to later that I really could be getting done right now because of certain anxieties and, you know, fears and things that I have. Um, so that kind of could create more suffering because I always have things hanging over my head if I keep pushing them to the future. Um, and also the busyness, kind of like I was saying before, sometimes we're so busy doing things that we think are necessary that we don't carve out enough time to do things that are pleasurable now. Like maybe we're so future oriented that we have to do all kinds of things that are going to benefit later, but we don't take time to smell the roses, so to speak, or maybe do self-care. All right. So we got to be careful of these things and, you know, shift things around where necessary. Okay, so developing a healthy relationship with time, all right? So time could be on your side, all right? I know there's a lot of corny jokes today, but you know. Um, okay, so one thing is flexibility, right? Flexibility is always associated with health, right? Whether it's mental flexibility or other kinds of flexibility. So we wanna be flexible in terms of moving between event time and clock time, right? So when things could be a little bit looser, let's say in social situations, we should go more event time. When we're in a situation where we have to be in a tighter schedule, we should be able to switch more to clock time, right? If we get too stuck in one orientation or another, it could potentially create problems. Um, with time comes the acceptance that things are always changing and nothing stays the same and uncertainty because the future didn't happen yet and we don't really know what's gonna happen, right? So working on those things helps us in our time orientation and our time relationship. Um, creating a healthy balance of past, present, and future orientations, like I was saying before, right? Because there's good things about all of them to some degree, but it's the way we look at them, all right? And working through time clashes in relationships. So let's, let's say I'm in a couple, right? Let's say I'm very clock time, for example. Let's say I'm very on the schedule, on the books, you know, making things exact. And let's say my partner is much more event time, much looser about things. Can you see how this could come up? So let's say we're both supposed to go to a party and the party starts at 3 p.m. And I say, come on, hurry up, it's 2.45, we gotta leave, we gotta get there, it's almost three o'clock. And then my partner says, oh, no, don't worry about it, I'm, I'm running a little late, I have to take a shower still, I'm, I'm still picking out my clothes, we'll get there when we get there, don't worry about it. And meanwhile, it's getting my anxiety up because I'm thinking we gotta get there by three o'clock and he's pissed off that I'm controlling him by saying we gotta get there at three o'clock thinking just relax, relax, right? So sometimes we gotta work it out with a partner who has a different time orientation than we do, right? Okay, making peace with the past. Oh, so important. Um, I like the quote here, the past is to be learned from not lived in, right? So we get a more positive past orientation when we learn the lessons we need to learn, as I was saying earlier, and not just ruminate about how it screwed us up right now. So we have to forgive ourselves, forgive other people, let certain things go, and catch ourselves ruminating about it and try to shift away from that, all right? Another thing we have to make peace with is our past self, right? So our present self has a relationship with our past self, whether you know it or not, okay? So I might have a lot of resentment toward my past self. Maybe I made decisions I didn't like. Maybe I acted in ways that I'd, I'm not very proud of. And I might spend a lot of energy hating who I used to be. Maybe I was, I was weak, I was vulnerable, and I, you know, or whatever I was. And I, if I keep hating that past self, I'm never gonna feel peace now. So I have to practice accepting who I was, remembering that I did the best I could at that time. I didn't have my current brain with me. I was younger, I, I didn't know, you don't know it till you don't know it. I mean, you don't know it till you know it, okay? So I didn't know what I know right now. I have to forgive myself for the mistakes that I made and make it better now by using my current wisdom and knowledge to make my life better, okay? So working this through is really important. 
Okay, of course, being mindful in the present, okay? Um, so taking time to do mindfulness practice, increasing your awareness of the present moment, experiencing it fully with all your senses, being patient with the process of whatever's going on in the present. Remember, it's about the journey, not just the destination. Um, allowing yourself to enjoy the life pleasures in the moment. And when you do it mindfully, you get so much more from it than if your mind is somewhere else. And often mindfulness goes hand in hand with acceptance. So accepting the present moment as it is and accepting the pace of life too. Okay, and relating skillfully to the future. Okay, so thinking ahead as creating some values and goals and dreams and things like that, but knowing that it may not 100% come true, we might have to be flexible with the outcome or even shift what goal we're working on based on how our life is going, okay? And also, just like we wanna relate skillfully to our past self, we also wanna have a good relationship with our future self, okay? So I wanna think about how I'm gonna feel in the future and respect the person I'm gonna be whoever, you know, a month from now, a year from now. So when I do that, I might make healthier decisions in the now, which will be better for my future self, such as the please skills, such as um, choosing healthy foods, such as being less impulsive now, such as wearing a seatbelt, such as having good relationships. You know, all those things that I do now will help the me of the future, okay? It's a little different way of thinking about it. Okay, and finally, um, some resources. All right, so a lot of the information I got about the past, present, future stuff was from a book called The Time Paradox, which was very interesting. Um, and if you wanna figure out more about your time orientation, they have um, online for free, um, these time inventories, okay? Um, so you could always check those out on thetimeparadox.com. I'll try to put the links um, below on YouTube so you could just click on it. Um, but it might be a fun, like kind of insightful, self-inventory you could take just to learn more about how you relate to time. All right. Well, I know this uh, presentation was a little long, so if you hung in there, thanks for hanging in there and listening. I hope you got something from it. And um, use the information, you know, try to use it to make yourself better. All right. Well, thank you for listening as usual, and uh, I'll see you again soon. All right. Take care, guys.